We invited by Stanford University to come and share experiences. Uh, it's a great honor, and I thank everyone here for this great uh, honor. Um, can you all hear me? If you can't hear me, just raise your hand. I'll probably move a bit or signal that the sound should come up. Well, everything starts from childhood. You have a chance to come into the world, and you have to make an impact. So, and it sort of dovetails into whatever you do as you grow up. So I'll just give you a little bit about my background, as in how I was brought up. I was born to, born in the eastern region of Ghana, and born to a farm. My mom was a farmer. My dad was a cocoa purchasing officer. And my dad was a very interesting guy. Um, early days that I remember, he would he saw me trying to steal a, a beer from an empty bottle. <laughs> and he said, why are you doing that? And of course, as a kid, I was standing there, maybe four or five years old, and looking. And he says, get some beer to drink. So, and I mean, here, he probably would have been arrested, but he poured me about a third of a glass, and I drank it. And I got drunk. <laughs> and then, when he gets a visitor, he tells me, you want to serve the visitor some beer? And I say, yeah, why not? And I'll go and get the beer, open it up, serve the visitor, and serve myself if it's not there. And I'll be waiting with the visitor. And those days, just for the sake of it, we had a gramophone, so we will just wind it, and I put the head on, and I'm entertaining the visitor. In other words, what I'm trying to say, he gave me the leeway, but any time I went out of bounds, he clipped it. And he used to beat me if I really went out of uh, uh, bounds and things like that. Um, but he decided that he would give me the best in education because he did not get it. And he was quite brilliant. I, I, I met a maid of his who was a professor. And the maid said, your father was a brilliant mathematician, but of course, he didn't get the chance to become a professor like me. And before that, my dad used to say that he was brilliant, but everybody's dad is brilliant, you know, but until I met the professor. <laughs> anyway, so I went to, through school, normal kid, and I remember something else. When we moved to my village, which has got a long name, for the sake of uh, uh, Amma, I would say Kukrantumi. That's how it's called. Uh, you know Kukrantumi? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> now, when we moved there, and this is early, early, long ago, I was the only guy who was we wearing sandals to school. And I went to school the first day and everyone started coming to see the guy who's wearing some funny thing on his feet. And I was very uncomfortable. So I just took off the sandals and hid the sandals. And every day when I'm dressed up to go to school, just before the school, I'll take my canvas off my feet and hide it in some banana plantation. So I'll be like an ordinary kid. One day, unfortunately, my mom came to the school. And first it was, where are your sandals? And everybody was looking. This guy has never worn sandals in this school. <laughs> and of course, I got some beatings, and they dragged me all the way home. And my dad was there. As soon as my dad saw the confusion, I think he understood. He says, come, 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 come. We have an issue. I say, yes, we have an issue. <laughs> then he says, uh, what happened to your sandals? I said, nobody wears sandals. Nobody. So... I was feeling a bit awkward. And he took his time and said, would you want everybody in that class to be wearing sandals? I said, yes, 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 yes. So you know it's good. I said, yes. He said, well, you can help them by wearing yours. And I'm sure by the next term, some parent will buy a sandals for the kid because you are taking the lead. And I said, yeah, but in the meantime, I mean, everybody. <laughs> but anyway, so reluctantly, I wore my sandals to school and everybody was looking at me. And true to his word, by the end of the term, we had about two, three people also wearing sandals. Anyway, then I moved on to secondary school and university like any normal kid, except I was a bit on the wayward side more than being the straight and proper. But my dad told me at one stage, he says, listen, let's have a bet. And I said, oh, what, what is a bet for? He says, well, it's difficult to pay your fees. I'm trying to get the best education. 
And you must promise me that you always bring good grace home. And I will also promise you that I will never fail in paying your fees. And I said, well, this is easy. So I pass and you pay. He said, yes. And we shook hands on it. I was probably about 13. And you know what it did? I will be with all the bad guys in school, but two weeks to exam, I must learn for that old man because I respected him and I loved him and I could not disappoint him. So until I finished university, I thought I was learning for the old man. I didn't know I was learning for myself. And most of my friends fell by the wayside because they didn't have some strong person who could keep them on the right track. But my dad was there for me. And so I finished university and I had uh, second class up. I did uh, BSc admin uh, in the Ghana's Premier University, which is Legon. And when I finished university, then it became very interesting. I was doing national service. I was paid 155 cities at the time. I don't know how much dollars it is. By the ninth of the month, my money was finished because I was doing all sorts of things. Um, <laughs> I go to a nightclub and move to another nightclub, and by 6 o'clock, I, I go to the last nightclub. So by the ninth, my money was finished. And I was asking myself, how am I going to get disciplined? How am I going to be successful like the people that I see? Then one day, I saw an advert, admissions into Ghana Armed Forces. And of course, I didn't like the army, it's zombie and all sort of things. But I read it anyway. Now, when I, I read it, it said, um, officers wanted, military officers wanted. I asked some guy, what do they get? What do they pay them? He said, well, you go in there, you certainly have three square meals a day because they feed you breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, you're given a room which is uh, furnished already. You pay the salary. And I said, bingo. I don't have any responsibility. Just present myself, three square meals a day. If my pay gets finished, I'll say eat anyway. I'll say have my room. And there's nothing better than that. So to the army I went. That was the only evaluation. <coughs> and I joined the army. I regretted initially, but I enjoyed it. And whilst I was in the army, I had a chance to take an exam. And after the exam, I was uh, given a chance to go to UK to become a chartered accountant. It took me one and a half years to become a chartered accountant. And I came back, and I was the only chartered accountant and there was a good degree to, to boot in the Ghana Armed Forces. But in the Army, it's not about what you know that gives you a responsibility, because colonels and above were heads of budget and other things. And even though they were not qualified accountants, and I was qualified accountant, I was still a paymaster. And I had to report so many levels before it gets to them. And I was complaining. I said, well, I'm not being allowed to use my qualification and things like that. But they found a place for me. But soon as I got back from London, when I was in London, there was the first revolution in Ghana, December 79, uh, June 79. And I wasn't going to come back to Ghana, but then they handed over to civilian government just in three months. So I came back, and when I got back, the army had been turned upside down, because the coup was organized by junior officers and other ranks and overthrew the hierarchy. It was at best, it was a mutiny, and I wasn't too happy with it. He said, okay, I will stay and let us turn things around. This is about 1980, 81, and there, there was another coup, 1981. And I said, enough is enough. I need to leave. So I left the armed forces in 1982 just because I was dissatisfied with the whole process. Now, what was I going to do? Because I just left, no plans. I went to Nigeria because most Ghanaians were in Nigeria at the time teaching. I didn't like it. I went to Liberia because I had <laughs> some job offer. I don't like it. I went back to London, and I went to a mate of mine. I said, I need to come and settle here in London. And he said, well, you don't have the right paper, so we can probably find some bookkeeping job for you. And I said, Louis, but I was smarter than you in class, and you're an accountant. <laughs> and he said, you don't belong here, and, and, and. So that's the best we can do for you. And I said, thank you very much. I got back to Ghana, and I had no other option but to try and fend for myself. My next door neighbor was a businessman. Well, I'm a business student. So I teamed up with him. I was, I was just under his tutelage because if he's going to collect his check, I went with him. He's going to buy something, I went with him. And then it's like, okay, um, Prince, you can go and try your hand here and there. 
So I started business. Long story short, I did all kinds of businesses. I was doing simple buying and selling like a general merchant. I was into timber, saw milling, and the rest. I was doing imports of wines, of floor tiles, of hard stuff, uh, like uh, uh, anything. Anything that had a margin, I would do it. I, and, and that was decent. <laughs> <laughs> I better add that. You know. And then I was in air conditioning business. I was uh, teaching at the Ghana Stock Exchange. I was, um, I was uh, in oil business, both downstream and midstream. And a lot of the businesses, I failed in them. But I learned my lessons from them and moved on. And some of them I did fairly well, but then at some point in time, um, I just lose it. Either I, because I do not agree with my friends or my partner or something. Then finally, in about 1995, 96, I really hit a very low position because my wife at the time left me with the kids. And I didn't have a permanent job. I was still a roving businessman, and she left with everything in the, in, the ho in the house. And it was really a disgrace, and I was saying, after so many years, and I was then about 44 years, and at 44, you don't have a home, you don't have your kids, you don't have a business that is thriving, and I said, I better find something to do, and do really quick. So I started <laughs> you know, being more aggressive with business and being more focused with business, and what happened was, any time I went to the banks and I had good opportunities, the banks were not there for me. Either they would waste so much time, I lose the business completely, or they will approve and tell me that, okay, um, you applied for maybe $20,000, but we can give you $3,000. And I'll ask them, why? Because it's a specific amount for a specific job, and I need exactly what I'm asking. And I was reflecting, here I was, I had a good degree in business. I was a chartered accountant. I was even a lecturer at the Stock Exchange. And I had done business for 12, 14 years. And I was a military, ex-military man, so quite disciplined. And I should appeal to everybody. And when I say yes, I mean yes. And I still couldn't raise money. And I was fighting them. And we had our quarrels and things like that. One, I think one thing led to another, and I said, Wait a minute, if I cannot raise money from the banks, then I'm wondering who can raise money from the banks. And this is Africa. There are not too many people with qualification and experience and things like that. So I said, well, I think there is a serious gap here, and I should look at providing financing for the SME sector, that is, people like me. In the economies of Africa, about 80% of the economy resides in the informal sector. That's basically small, medium-sized enterprises and things like that. And I was reflecting, I'm saying, really, really, I must understand the banks because a bank is a formal institution with so many years of development and everything. And we say we are in the informal sector. So really, there's a disconnect straight away by definition. How can a formal institution serve an informal setup? So I said, let's form a company and understand this informal, huge informal sector and see how we can learn to them because the banks are failing them from the experience that we had. And that is how the UT story began. In 1996, 97, we got a license from the central bank and myself and three young, not so qualified people, we decided that we'll set up a company. And we had a one-room office in the not-so-good part of Accra. And the office, it's, the, the shot is not too close. There used to be water log in front here. And the office started from this corner, just one room with one big table there. And we all would sit by this table, and we're thinking, what can we do? What do we have? And the total assets of the company at the time was, at best, maybe $20,000. Just uh, And the, the equipment was coming from my partner. My partner was running that, in that corner. 
a communication center where people come and make calls, they'll send telescopes and fax and things like that. So those became the equipment uh, we had in the office. And I threw in my car and a few things, and my driver became one of the three who was uh, the employees of the company. So the thing is, I'm sure you want to know about the kind of challenges that we had at the time. <coughs> of course, we had all sorts of challenges, you can imagine. But generally in Africa, I think the challenges come from, broadly speaking, two areas. One is this infrastructure that governments must put in place for businesses to thrive. This wasn't there. And then the other one is the culture of the people that you have to deal with. That's your customers and your staff and things like that. And when it comes to Africa, our culture, our cultures really plays its part in creating the kind of people that we are. Now, on the government side, um, in Ghana, for example, we don't even have addresses. Address system, I think, number five, whatever road and things, is, is, is absent. So uh, if you're trying to lend, it means you must find your own ways of identifying where the houses are, where the offices are, and things like that, because the roads are not named and the houses are not numbered. Um, also, we have a system where the police can be corrupted or they are corrupt to some extent, and the courts are not delivering justice on time. And to lend, you need the police, you need the courts, you need to have addresses. So those structures are not there. And uh, to connect from even uh, someone was giving us uh, his experience in Ghana this afternoon, uh, some roads, maybe 100 miles, would take you about five to seven hours to go 100, 100 miles. So those were some of the challenges that we had from lack of structures and infrastructure. But the other problem is the problem with our, the culture of Ghanaians or generally Africans. Because when we start businesses, we look at the businesses as an extension of the individual. So if I start a business, I'm the owner of the business, I'm not different from the business. The business money is my money. If I need something, I just dip my hands in, take the money and spend it as I want. And therefore, in trying to serve this sector, we had to actually find ways and means of disbursing these monies and monitoring the monies and making sure we can collect the monies. We also had other problems like getting the trust of the people for them to lend us their monies because the banks would not give us any monies. They didn't understand what we were about. They had never been there for us. So we had all sorts of challenges. But then what we did was where we had the problems, we had to be quite innovative to find ways around it. For example, with the address system, one day I heard that some of my staff, who were about eight at the time, had collected monies from some of the clients and shared the monies amongst themselves. And I got so mad, I sacked everybody. So from a staff of eight, we got to a staff of one myself. And I was saying, how do I then know where the debtors live? Because the guys who knew where the debtors lived had all been sacked. So <laughs> I had to eat uh, a humble pie and call two people and give them strong warning and said, next time. But it really, it wasn't, I didn't have a choice. I had to give them another chance. <laughs> and, and then they, with, uh, with their help, were able to put some of these debtors back on track. And then immediately, I pulled the whole team into our one room and I said, we're going to learn a bit of geography. Everyone will learn how to sketch from a point to another point. So if you, if you go to a client, you find a point which is easily, which can be referred to easily, let's say um, Kwame Nkrumah Circle or some kind of runabout or something, and you will sketch from that point to the house of the client. And then we had our own keys, as in broken line means on tarred road. A straight on broken line means the road is tarred. And then we had triangle, meaning a billboard, and so on and so forth. And for every loan, you have to sketch to the house of the, of the client, give me another sketch to the collateral, and give me another sketch to um, the offices if, if these three things are different. And so we. It's not only about the addresses. Anytime we find a problem, we have to sit down and strategize and see how we can really 
mitigate those risks. Because the government won't say that because somebody owes you, I'm going to name that particular road for you. You have to find the solutions yourself. Now, with this kind of attitude, and it was because there was a lot of loyalty to the company. I was sitting right with them, and the values and everything actually came for me, and I had to infect them with it for us to do a good job. Now, from then on, we grew slowly and at quite a good pace. And then we were also challenged by the regulators. At some point in time, we decided that we wanted a new branch in Tema, which is about maybe uh, 25 kilometers from Accra. That's the port area. And the regulator did not want us to have a branch. And I read the policies of the central bank, and it says, if you should open an office, you should inform the central bank within 21 days. But the operators were saying, you have to take uh, authorization from us. So I just, I checked, talked to lawyers, and I said, what's the true position? I said, listen, really, the law, as, as written in black and white, says you should inform them, but they will certainly not let you open an office. So I said, go ahead and let's open an office. So we went and opened an office in Tema. And they heard about it, and they came for inspection. And they said, some of your files are not here, so we don't have the complete business. I said, well, that is true. Some of the files are in Tema. So why have you opened an office in Tema? I said, well, because some of the business is in Tema. You are not supposed to have a branch in Tema. I said, I don't have a branch in Tema. So what office is that? I said, it's a liaison office. And they said, what do you mean a liaison office? I said, a liaison, I mean, open a dictionary, you see liaison office. And in time, they started referring to it as UT's branch in Tema. So they accepted it without, uh, un unconsciously accepted it. And quickly, we opened up two more branches in Kumasi and Takradi. <laughs> and uh, they, they had to accept because they accepted one branch, we put in um, other branches. And we grew to a point where we had and we're the only non-bank that had branches. But we grew to a point where we had about 16 branches uh, scattered all, all over the southern part of, of Ghana. Now, our service to the people was so successful, and really, the unique selling proposition was that, and this is a bit of ironical, because if you look at the SME informal sector, this is the group that probably don't speak even too much English. The, not, the owner is probably not qualified in, as in having a degree or anything. They don't have qualified people in the company. They don't keep good books of accounts. They want to hide their monies and not declare. And therefore, they cannot plan for, say, a month or two months. Now, so they needed the financing or funding in the quickest possible time. So a typical um, non-bank, or sorry, a typical informal sector person or SME comes to you and he says, I need $10,000. He means now. Because somebody is trying, is standing outside his shop trying to supply him, with him or her with some goods. So you must find a way of financing them as quickly as possible. And that was a challenge. As opposed to a corporate with the right structures, because they can plan and budget and see when they need the money, so they probably don't need it that fast. So here we were. The banks were probably using about two months to give a loan to companies with all the right structures in the formal sector. And here we have the informal sector, which hasn't got all the structures and is a riskier part of the sector, and they rather need the money faster. Now, to a normal banker, if you are riskier, they have to take more time, not less time. So what we had to do was to find a way of doing loans to these uh, informal sector operators in the shortest possible time. So I remember at one point in time, I called my staff and I said, we have a problem. If we don't do the loans fast enough, our clients will lose the business. So how can we cut the loan delivery period? And we actually said, let's go through all the the credit processes, from the time the client calls in the office to the time we're able to give the client the money. 
Okay, the client comes to the office, what does the client do? He probably sees an officer in the bank and tells the client the problem, come back with application letter, and, and, and. And we started cutting the processes down. And I said, let's aim at one week delivery time. That's from the time the client comes in to the time they get a loan is one week. And he said, it's not possible. I said, let's look at it, let's try. Because if we don't, we're not able to achieve that, we're not serving the clients well. Now, it to surprise you to notice that even before your application gets to your branch manager, that's probably about a month. Because you come and tell the project officer or the relation manager, and they listen to your story, they go forwards and backwards and try to capture it, and then they wait for the next, uh, the branch manager to come in and accept it, and then it goes to the credit uh, appraisal committee, whatever. So we said, okay, no one should come to us with an application. Don't. Just walk to us if you are in need of money and come and tell us your story. So from the reception, you came to me and I was the MD and branch manager all in one because we had only one branch. <laughs> now, so what it took was I would just listen because really, if we're not going to do the loan for you, we don't have to waste your time. So I'll listen and tell you that thanks for coming to see us. The next time you have A, B, C, and D in place, come back and we could do some business. But for now, you don't qualify. And I love that because I save people their time. Instead of going to the bank for about two months only to be told that you're not going to get the money. We use five minutes, at times two, maybe ten minutes at most. And we tell you, sorry, we can't do it. And where I think that, yes, there's some business we can do, I hand you over to the team. And the team will now take the full story and move with you the same day, or if it's late in the day, the next day, to go and quickly do the assessment. Feel the pulse of the business. Not give us five years of accounts, audited accounts, but come and feel the business. And we'll extract the figures as in the stock level, uh, sales per week, per day, per month. Uh, your checkbook will give us some information. Any register you have will give us some information. And they will bring back to the office a statement of affairs of the business. And that informed us plus the collateral and things that you have as to whether to do the loan or not. Now, interestingly enough, other things that we have to do is like, if you have to value the collateral, put valuation to the collateral, you need an expert, a professional who's going to do the valuation. And it can take about three weeks or one month to get a good report bound with the pictures and open market value and all that. And we ask ourselves, do you really need a valuation report to do a loan? Obviously, no. What you need is a, it's a professional job telling you the value of the collateral. So we were debating about it, and I said, the surest way is to employ a, val a valuer. So UT then employed a valuer. So the valuer will go to the property, why is he writing a report? And then he will call me and say, Chief, I say, yes, the property is $100,000 plus or minus $10,000. And that's all you need, really, to value it. And because he was in our, our employment, we could rely on it instead of going for somebody else. So these were some of the things that we had to put in place to really cut down the, 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 the loan time. And as soon as we were able to cut it down to one week, I challenged them. I said, let's cut it to two days. And that really sounded crazy, but we were able to cut it down to two days in the process, we had to build other structures and institutions in it. So we now hit the market and said, UT Financial Services, your loan in 48 hours. And the competition was saying, oh, these guys are crazy. It's not possible. And people came to us and experienced it, that we were able to do loans for them in 48 hours or less. In actual fact, for clients who were coming for repeat loans, it could be one hour because we had a collateral in place, and people would come and deposit the collateral and said, keep it. I need money, they take it, they go, come back and say, my collateral is already there, I haven't moved it. And we had repetitive clients and so on and so forth. Now, the company grew in about 10 years to 11 years in 2008. We went for a strategy session and we said, we're still not providing all the financial services. The crucial part is the lending, but some clients could come to us, take a loan, of say $100,000 and go to their bankers with the money and ask for an LC to be, to be established for them. And that could take about a week. And we're saying, if we give the money in 48 hours, 
and the bank will take about a week, two weeks to establish an LC against that money, then surely um, they're taking advantage of our clients. So we need to become a bank. And the challenge was to become a bank and still have the speed and the flexibility and be able to meet regulatory requirements and so on and so forth. Now what we did was, and note this, for the company that we started with total assets of $20,000 odd, when we decided to go to a stock exchange in 10 years time after that, we had a total capitalization of $90 million. And it's because we were investing everything back into the company. When I wasn't being paid any serious money, we never paid dividends to anybody. We put the monies back and grew the business. Now, when we got to the bank, the challenges were different. It's not regulatory matters. And uh, one thing I always say about a regulator is, it's like a big articulated truck on, on a very narrow road. If you stay behind the truck, you have to go at the track space. If you stay by the side, because the road is narrow, it will push you off into a ditch. The only way for you to go is to stay ahead of that track. But once you're ahead of that track, make sure you don't break down, because if you break down, it will run over you. <laughs> and that's been the policy of UT dealing with regulators. We always stay ahead, but make sure we don't make any mistakes, and we run fast enough to keep enough pace. So um, I want to actually uh, show you the slide. Now, in doing business, and I met um, Professor Jim Patel, and he said, when he's talking about business, what he needs to know with everyone is their commitment or the passion that they have. And he wishes that they have two electrodes and you can connect to their chest to test if they have the passion or the commitment. <laughs> I think the same. I think what really makes anything happen is the passion you have for the job. Now, since this is an institution of learning, I want to share what I believe um, creates the passion or brings out the passion. And you should look for it. To have passion for the thing that, anything that you're doing, one, you must have love. Two, you must have two types of love. One love is just love for people, love for humanity. That's come for your upbringing. You should have the right values and things like that. You must be a people who respects other people and wants to see people develop. You must be that type. So you must have love for people. The second love is, and this is what you have to look out for, you must have love for a service or a product. It may not come now. You probably have missed it, but it may come back again. But as you try your hands on other businesses, you find a product or a service, and you fall in love with it because of what it can do to people. And you match that love and say, this is what the people I love need. So you take the love for the service or product and try to make it available to the people that you love. And in the intersection is where you have passion. Love for service of products and love for people. And that brings out the passion. I would wake up in the morning and I knew what these loans would do for these people and their families and the workers and everything. And for eight years, I didn't go for one day's leave. No leave for eight years. I would jump out of my bed and I'm going to look for money and I'm going to serve it on other people and collect my monies back. And I, to finish that part, when I was... Uh, when the company was about 15 years old, I'd gone on leave eight days. And I said, this is not fair. I haven't been fair to myself. So I have to go on seven more days leave. So it will be 15 days for 15 years. <laughs> but it came out of the passion that I had. I knew what the laws were doing for this sector. And I loved it. And, and, and therefore, I loved the, the lending. And I loved what it was doing to the people. And therefore, it gave me the passion. Now, on, on, the, on the services side, the kind of products that you give them on the processes and the profitability, which ensure the sustainability. On the people side is where you have your customers, the feel for your customers, the feel for the people, that is your staff and things like that, and the values that, that, that actually generate them. So these 
uh, for the right side, the services, where you have products, processes, packaging, consistency, and structure, and things like that. That determines the kind of services that you provide. And the top is really about the people, the customers, and your own people. And these are the critical success factors. You must have good customers. You must have good people delivering the services. You must have good services. And then, of course, you must have the processes that deliver the products and things like that. So as you go about, ask yourself, do I really love people? If you, have, if you love people generally, you have the right values towards people, you respect everyone, you've had one of the love issues. Now, you get into business, you, get, you, meet, you see all kinds of products and services, see the one that you, you fall in love with. And this afternoon, one of the interns were talking about a Ghanaian who started uh, Coco, Coco, Coco is a porridge, it's a breakfast thing. And the guy just says, this breakfast, if you take it in the morning, it's so nutritious and I want people to taste it. So he has love for the cocoa and he's supplying people to make sure that they benefit from it. And he's in good business. It can be anything. If you think water is what is most important to people and therefore you want to give them pure water, you can start a water factory tomorrow and you'll be successful because you keep thinking about how to better it how to improve upon it so it affects the lives of people, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm moving fast forward because uh, I'm checking my time and I have 30 minutes and I'm almost at the end of it. I'm not too happy about it, but I'm enjoying it. I hope you are. <laughs> now, this slide here is talking about the present UT, what we have now. I did tell you that because we wanted speed, and to deliver the loans in a, a very timeless manner. We had to create institutions to handle it. And therefore, by default, we created a logistics company. And by default, again, and the logistics company was actually helping the, the financial services in, in financing importers. Then by default, we created a UT properties company because we needed valuers, we needed people who, who would do property management, and we also had UT collections because our collection was so effective, other banks and financial institutions were asking us to collect the money for them. <laughs> then we have UT life insurance because where the guys don't have collateral or anything, you actually tend to give them key man's insurance. And we said, why don't you rope in all those monies here? And then we have UT private securities. This is quite interesting. I went out to a function. I got there, I was the chairman for the function. And this security guy comes and he says, hey, move, you cannot park there. And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I know I understand, but I'm the chairman for the function. And he said, okay, then you can park there. <laughs> so I parked. Then I, went, I drove to my office after that function, and the security guys on the premises of UT were doing the same thing to, the same thing to some of our clients. And I said, if we want to provide the best services, customer service to our clients, and we don't take care of them outside our doors, the story is not complete. So I called a friend of mine. I said, General, can you come over? He said, yes. I said, I want you to form a security company for us. He said, why? I said, we want our own security company so that the customer service starts from the gate, not from the door. And it's a very interesting uh, company that we have there. And we tried to do what we did in Ghana. We went to Nigeria with a non-bank financial service as we started and uh, started growing the business. And again, in South Africa, we're also in South Africa trying to do the same. So currently, as we speak, we have UT Bank, which has a staff of about 850 and assets of about $500 million. Uh, logistics, staff of about 40, assets about $4 million, properties, and the rest. The total um, um, value in terms of assets is probably in the region of about $600, $600 million. From what we started 17 years ago with assets of about $20,000. And that is the story of UT. Now, I need to put this slide on because to be able to achieve anything, you must have strong values. 
And when you start, the values are really emanating from the leader. And the values that we have, integrity, because without integrity, you'll be lying to your staff, you'll be lying to your mates, you'll be lying to your customers. It is, you need to be honest to people, and that comes from the love for the people. Professionalism, if you don't know what you're about, of course, you, you collapse the whole business. Stepping up to the plate, what we mean is that promise, if you have to promise, be careful what you, you promise them. What we said we'll do loans in 48 hours. We had done our homework and we gave them exactly that. So you promise carefully and make sure you deliver. Why not is the innovative part of it. Challenge yourselves. A loan in 48 hours, why can't it be done? Because the banks are doing it for in two months, you want to also do it in two months, you must be innovative and say, that cannot be right, it's not helping the people. Ubuntu is actually a South African word, it's a Zulu word, and normally um, it's uh, attributed to Nelson Mandela, but it's just, it's just part of the language. And it means that we are family, the whole universe. All human beings are family. I am who I am because of who you are, and that there is connectivity amongst all of us. And finally, it's about respect, respecting everybody. And if you come to UT, you can find a messenger giving me a hug, or me giving the messenger a hug. Everybody's role is important. Everyone has a right to be in this world. Nobody has a better right in this world. And respect each other and give each other a bit of space. The Bible says, love thy neighbor as thyself, which is a bit maybe more demanding, but at least respect thy neighbor <laughs> as thyself. <laughs> Finally, the final slide is to say that, fast forward, This is where we started and grew to cover this space. And this is where UT in terms of uh, infrastructure is. This is the head office of UT Holdings and that is the head office of UT Bank. So in short, it can't be done, but it has to be done with the right values and with a love for people and love for services. On this note, I think I'll say thank you very much and I'll invite questions. Thank you so much, uh, Captain Amabe. <laughs> um, uh, in Ghana, um, I met him. He's one of the, he's one of actually the funniest and um, most powerful personalities in Ghana. Um, oh, thank you, Dad. <laughs> more than, um, and thank you so much for sharing your story because a lot of times I guess um, and I worked in the media um, a lot of what we hear coming out from Africa is always a sad story and it's always like super empowering to hear some of these huge success stories um, we'd like to open uh, the floor up for questions uh, I'll go ahead and start with mine um, so you started with a company with a company of three people and you've grown it to over 800 people um, 2,000. 2,000 people, sorry. Um, and one of the things you kept um, emphasizing is people, passion, um, and, p and working with people who have a love for people. And I'm curious to understand better how you were able to foster that in your team, especially as your team continued to grow. Oh, yeah, I don't need this. <laughs> Well, Amma, thank you very much. The thing is, I think it all starts with the leadership. Um, there are no two ways about it. Um, when we started with three people uh, with me, I made sure that I showed respect to them, I showed loyalty, I showed transparency. They knew what were going. I, 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 I mentored them, I coached them. We had training for them as we grew. And I remember when we were about about 100 plus people. I had this session which we called PK 101, and I'm PK. And I actually sit down with every staff member two times in a year and ask them how they're feeling, family issues, whatever issues, and offer advice and things like try to solve them for them. So I was there for them, and I set the pace because up to today, with offices, international everything, 
If you come to my office, I still wear a name tag because every staff must wear a name tag. So as a leader, you have to be disciplined enough to make sure that you set the pace. Even whether the, the staff see you or not, they know what you stand for. And you also have to put structures, processes, and policies in place. You must not go against those policies. And anybody who goes against those policies, you apply what the policy says to them. And it's very simple. Hi, uh, my name is Lois. Um, I work with the IFC in Ghana, and I have IFC. Pri prior to joining the GSD, yes. Um, I have uh, one question, and uh, it's regard. You spoke about uh, the challenges you faced uh, doing business in Ghana, and when we look at the slide, you're going outside Ghana, you're going to South Africa, you're going to other African countries. So uh, I would really like to know the challenges you are facing working across Africa with different regulations, different. Uh, economies, really different languages. How are you facing those challenges? Okay, that is good. Um, in going to other countries, we're not going as UT Bank because to put a bank in Nigeria, you need a capital of $250 million, and we don't have it. So what we've done is we're going to these countries as a non-bank, just as we started in Ghana, and then grow the non-bank and hopefully it can become a bank someday. Now, yes, we have different challenges. For example, in Accra, our staff will walk into a shop and pick money in a bag and bring it to the office and it's counted and, that, and the client's account is credited. In South Africa, even ATMs, they bomb them. ATMs, they, they actually put dynamite to it and blow it up and, and take the monies out. So obviously you can't walk into a shop <laughs> and pick money into the office. So we have to be smart and find ways and means of disbursing the monies through a card system that we established and for the clients to put their monies back onto the card so we can credit the account. In Nigeria, when we went to Nigeria, they said, oh, you guys do loans in 48 hours. I said, yes. They said, you can do it in Nigeria. I said, um, no, <laughs> make it 72 hours. And they said, why? I said, traffic will take 24 hours. <laughs> you know, so yeah, we have to actually we have the processes, uh, that the UT process, and we have a software that actually backs it with approvals and everything. But as we go into any country, you have to actually take into account the cultural nuances and also tweak it here and there um, for, for, for you to succeed. And we learn. So obvious what it means is that we get better as we go from country to country. Because we now have a card system, for example, from South Africa, and we also know traffic experience from Nigeria, if we have to go into Kenya, we study it. If it's Nigeria type, we say 72 hours. If it's Ghana type, 48 hours. <laughs> so, yes, we have to learn. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kevin Schuster. I'm part of Voto Mobile, a company based in Kumasi. And I was previously a fellow at the Meltwater Entrepreneurial School of Technology in East Ligon. Uh, thank you for the role you're playing in, in inspiring. Did you hear? Did you hear of beauty when you were in Ghana? Oh yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> you're one of the big role models of the entrepreneurs. So thank, thank you. you for the role you're playing in inspiring the the next generation. Uh, my question is, uh, could you speak a bit about your mobile strategy at UT Bank and kind of the mobile strategy? Yes. Yeah. Um, what, one of the things is banks thrive on deposit taking. And as a new bank, uh, we have to find ways and means of uh, mobilizing deposits. And uh, the banks are good at it. Uh, they organize raffles and things like that. If you deposit so much, you can probably win so much, some of which we're doing at the moment. But we had to find special ways of mobilizing deposits faster. And of course, we're looking at mobile money, uh, mob uh, mobile phone, money on mobile phone, and things like that. But one thing that we actually did, which uh, changed the game a little bit, and I'm sure that's what you're referring to, we ordered from the US a bank on wheels. Virtually, it's a van which is on wheels, and it's got tellers in the van, and it's got um, uh, ATMs on the van. So the, 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 the van can drive to a community and provide full banking services. And it's connected, so it's real-time banking, and uh, once you deposit money, with a van, you can actually go to any UT bank and have access to your money. We started with two trucks. We had the intention of putting in an additional 10 trucks and then grow the business. 
we had initial problems. I think maybe you're not aware of that. When you drove to a community, and this was very good because one van could serve about five communities. It goes Monday, market day, then it moves to Tuesday, market day, and things like that. So we thought it was perfect. Now, when they drove to the villages and they were able to deposit some money, even in time, they pack everything back and they're driving away. And they said, you can't go away. You can't take our money away. Because they're, they're, they're used to seeing banks in brick and mortar. And uh, for a bank to move with their money, so we had to actually go to the place again and again and educate people and things like that with the uh, last speakers and tell them that, no, we're here, your, your money will be found anywhere you see the UT sign. It's not just this van, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's still a good thing because, uh, uh, because of that, we had a fire in uh, the head office one morning and we had to close the head office. All we did was to move one of the vans to the head office area and it covered up for it. So the mobile van issue is quite good, and uh, once it stabilizes, we will import a bit more trust. But again, the other banks are sitting there watching, and they, 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 they are not innovative enough, and we we'll always try new things and try to beat the competition. Thank you. One last question. Uh, Why? Is it the time is up? <laughs> <laughs> I was just warming up. <laughs> Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I thought it was brilliant when you described the informal sector. Business in the informal sector is an extension of the individual. What percentage of your clients did you think needed uh, financial education and how much time did you have to spend to educate your clients? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, You know, any time I'm talking to a client, I'm interviewing a client and trying to judge whether we could do a loan or not. For me, what mattered was the character of the client. And, and the way to do it is, I get very informal, you walk in, I'm saying, oh, maybe you resemble my brother who is this and that, and we start some informal conversation. And I'm trying to judge your character and I ask you, are you married? Where do you live? Who are your parents? Are you very free with your dad? And things like that. I'm trying to judge your character. And, I didn't learn it from any particular source. I just developed the flair for asking these questions and trying to put the guy in some kind of, uh, um, uh, judge, make a judgment about the guy. Now, if you have someone who is upright and wants to do the right thing with the right character, then you can actually reason with them and teach them and things like that. Some of them are crooks and they come and they, it's like Tom and Jerry. They're trying to see what you want and try to find a story around it. But to come to your point, we realize that, as I said, some can't even speak good English, so we have to do a lot of literacy campaigns for them directly. Uh, at times when we visit them, we have to let them know how to keep their books and how to do better business because it helps them and it helps us going forward. And we have to organize a literacy campaign. In the markets, we tell the market um, chiefs that we come in this day, they close a bit early or have a break and meet our team and we tell them the right things to grow their businesses, uh, how to understand money, how to deposit monies or, or take loans and not let it hold on to the money too long. And we have a whole, a whole series of things educating them. Uh, and also for some of them, we give them informal, formal education. So uh, it is a, an important part because you need to develop them and eventually and hopefully bring them to the formal sector. Thank you very much, Mr. Mabing. Actually, I'll ask you if you have any final words of wisdom. A lot of us are students, workers, very interested in working in Africa, just things that we need to be keeping top of mind and interesting opportunities you think might be good to wrap it up. Okay, um, thank you very much. I think um, one of the challenges I find in Africa and every, every concerned African is worried about is keeping to time. <laughs> I like the way you laugh, but it's not something you laugh about. <laughs> you see, as humans and being alive, all we have, all we have is time. In other words, your life is just the time you have here on earth. 
If you say somebody lived 70 years, it means he had 70 years of time. 70 years is seconds, minutes. So I find that to respect any human being, you respect their time. If you disrespect their time, you've disrespected the whole human being. It is that serious. Now, the biggest crime in the law books is murder. Murder is when you shorten somebody's life, the time they have on this earth. That is murder. So if you waste somebody's one hour, you've committed partial murder. <laughs> <laughs> it's as serious as, this is how serious it is. So in dealing with people, respecting people, and this, if you get it right, that is ultimate customer service. When somebody walks to you and is looking for a service, use as little as their time as possible and give their life back to them or their time back to them for them to decide what they want to do with it. Now, the time that you take to serve them, the additional bit is make sure it's quality time and they find it memorable. Because there are two aspects to time, the sheer quantity of it and the quality of it. Quantity, you don't determine it. Quality, you can do something about it. So customer service and to win clients and all that, make sure that you deal with them in the shortest possible time. If you have to extend it, ask their permission and show concern and don't waste their time because you're wasting their life. And make sure that the time you spend with them is quality time. They say, oh, I went to UT. Oh, the guy was so nice. Oh, no, I have to go again. And that is what life is about. In Africa, we got it all wrong. The moment you're successful or you're a big man, it means you can just disrespect everybody's time. And I think really, 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 if we will address our woes in Africa with respect for time, the other things will fall into place. And it is not a joke. So keep that. And if you want to think about innovation, don't think anything. Think time. Is a new product or service going to save time? Or is, is it going to give quality time? It must qualify under one of these things. Is that a saving time or providing quality time? Nothing else matters. Thank you very much. To pay. The US, when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We, the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who's going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK-16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. 
There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there. Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering, we pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. Thank you.